My Gavan and Melonine, and well met indeed. I'm Arachir Galadrith, and head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer. And welcome back to the same as we continue with Developer Diaries, and this is number 33. It's been some time since the last one, and this Developer Diary is going to cover almost exclusively the changes to the Anduin and Ened White. There are very few non-Anduin and Ened White changes today. But I will start with the ones that aren't about those, and as ever we're on the campaign map first. And the first one is a very minor name change for Moria, in anticipation of Moria's overhaul, which is also on the list and, and will come down the line. Uh, their Heavy Goblin units, so Heavy Goblin Infantry, Heavy Goblin Crossbows, etc. have been renamed to Black Pit Infantry, or Black Pit Crossbows. So that's the first little minor change. Secondly, although I can't show you him at the moment due to technical difficulties, but Boromir has been given a new campaign strategy model that reflects his armoured um, version. So the, the, the Boromir that we see in the extended edition of the films, giving his speech in Osgiliath after he retook the western uh, eastern bank, sorry, uh, that Boromir is now the campaign strategy model. So he's no longer in his travelling gear. This is in, in line with the upgrade that he was given on the battle map, whereby he now wears his armour on the battle map as well. But keeping with campaign strategy models, let's turn to the Anduin, and theirs have been updated to reflect their new system as well. So this one here, Lord Bayon, is unique, I'm pretty sure, to Bayon. I don't think that one passes on to whoever is the leader. I think that's just Bayon. Uh, but in any event, that is what he starts the game with. If the leader does have that one, then I apologise. Your generals now look like this fellow here, armoured with a shield on his back, and if we slip to the right-hand side, there is the shield just there. Uh, and your captains look like this fellow, Captain Utreo. Bit of a mouthful. Um, he looks like if he wasn't wearing the belt, he'd be bursting out of that, uh, <laughs> out of his clothing. But those are the new campaign strategy models. They are in line with the obviously large roster overhaul that the Anduin has had. Now, forgive me if I have covered most of what I'm about to say about the Anduin. I don't think I did. But we are going to see most of their roster today, and I'm going to explain how the barracks works. And if that did happen in episode 32, I can only apologise. But in very brief, we'll go over the barracks. So the first point about the barracks is that it is now a choice in every single settlement. So the Anduin now have very few restricted units at all, except that every settlement has to make a choice. So in Framsburg, for example, um, we can show you here. So everyone gets the muster ground straight away, which gives you the two militia units. Then you make the choice. Bjorning camp, Woodman camp, Eothead camp. Uh, once you've built one of those buildings, you are then locked out of the other two lines, and you can only upgrade it to either the Bjorning barracks, Woodman range, or Eothead stables. And what I mean by that is if you build the Bjorning camp, you can only then get the Bjorning barracks. You can't upgrade to one of these three. So you can't get Bjorning tier one and, and Woodman tier two because the system doesn't allow for that. Uh, although, I mean, it, it does actually. We could do it that way, but I don't think that's... Uh, I, we would rather just keep the lines. Is it a bit easier? Maybe a point to discuss. Um, the Bjornings, as we will see in the second half of the video when we go to the battle map and actually look at their roster, but as a general overview, the Bjornings are your main line infantry, but also your strike infantry. So they deal very... Um, they hold, will hold the line. You get Bjorning spearmen in the first barracks, and in the second barracks, you get the shield bearers and the defenders. So three solid line holding units. But you also get Bjorning axemen, and bear warriors, who are both now fantastic strike infantry. So um, that, that's what the Bjornings bring, defensive units and strike infantry. The woodmen bring archers and ambush units, so and we'll just keep it in the second barracks. So the first one gives you the woodmen warriors, who are ambush sword and shield units, and woodmen hunters, who are really good early game archers. The second tier gives you woodmen wardens, um, which again are just a better version of the warriors. They hide anywhere, but with just better stats. And then the woodman trackers and greenwood foresters, both then archer upgrades as well, with the greenwood foresters being actual ranger units, because as you all know, rangers have a specific function in DAC and they act as very elite archers for most human nations. And lastly, the Aethead, as you might expect, give you cavalry. So the first tier gives you Aethead horsemen, um, and they are a javelin cav unit. That's the only one you get out of the first tier. But then the second tier gives you Aethead cavalry and Aethead archers, cavalry archers, dedicated cavalry, and then Fram's guard. Now the Fram's guard, I believe, do. Um, oh, did we restrict them actually? I'm not sure that we did. I think they are possibly available everywhere. Let's have a look. Let's go to another town and then assess it there. So Dwimberg, you're a town that could get anyone. 
Do you get Fram's Guard? Oh, yeah, I think they are available. Over. So Fram's Guard are just elite heavy hitting cavalry, but they're a bit more of a focus on anti-cavalry. So their role really is killing other cav. That's their primary function, but they're just heavy hitting cav in any event. They'll still charge into the enemy for a great deal of damage. So that's how the barrack system works. Those are the three different armor line uh, unit lines, and I'm pretty sure I've not shown the units, so I'm going to show them in the second half. And if I have, as I say, I apologize again. Um, now, Gleowine has um, Aetheod archers as his bodyguard. Where does Gleowine start up in Framsburg? I'm thinking he's over here because of my Anduin campaign. So here is our old chum, Gleowine, and he starts with Aetheod archers. So he's a really, really powerful early game general once again and contributes greatly, I think, to the Anduin's campaign being somewhat simpler than perhaps we want it to be at the moment, it might be changed. Remember as well, Gleowine does have his own battle map model as well, so he doesn't look like a, a skin changer on the battle map, which is good. Fastrid is similar as well, because both Gleowine and Fastrid are of course Northmen, they are not skin changers, um, and they're both from the... well, he's a woodman and uh, Gleowine of course is an Aetheod. Um That's not what you'd call someone who's... For, who's... Oh, I don't know. I don't know the nomenclature in that instance, I'm afraid. But both Fastrid and Gleowide have battle map models that are unique to them. The Sylvan March Warden unit that the Anduin used to get in much of Mirkwood is now trained out of the unique building in Dol Guldur and there only. So it is a one-off unit that comes from Dol Guldur and is, will be the best archer unit in your entire roster. You just get a unit of elves for capturing Dol Guldur is essentially how you need to look at it now. Um, they require a very high Anduin culture, though, of 75%, so it will be some time before you can take them, unless you rush Dolgaldor early. Now, the other aspect of the Anduin script is their upgrade, the way that they upgrade, because as you know, the, one of the big things with version 5 is that all of the town restrictions are being lifted for most of the nations, bar a few. There are a couple who will still be restricted for law, very, very law-accurate reasons, but also for balance reasons. But most of the complaints against Anduin, Enidwyth, Dunland um, and Moria was that they couldn't, they had no sense of progression. So in the, you, most of your roster is available to you by about turn 50. And then so you have no incentive to carry on. So now you can upgrade the Anduin's towns. It's the same with Enid Wyth, and we'll discuss that in a moment. And the way that the Anduin do it is by securing the mountain passes and thus opening up trade with the rest of the world and bringing in the skills that they need to advance as a nation through trade. So in order to do that, they build a very special building line called the Mountain Watchtowers. Now, as a standalone building, it's fairly useful. It gives you trade goods and a flat income of plus 50. It only costs a thousand. So that's not too bad and it has two upgrades thereafter uh, or three sorry the mountain outposts and then the mountain keep and as you can see as it goes up it gets progressively better and more economical to build the final tier the mountain hold is actually just a reward for getting the upgrades um, that one you don't need to build to unlock the system. And the way that it works is each one of these is assigned a certain point number. I think it's 10 for the watchtowers, possibly 12 for the outposts and maybe 15 for the keep. I can't quite remember the exact numbers, but you need to get to 100 essentially. So it's a hidden figure that you can't keep track of, I'm afraid. So it might pop up rather randomly for you in your mind in the game. But in truth, of course, it is being tracked by the game. So the mountain watchtower, I think that one does give 10. So you could build 10 of those. Although I think, I think the boost is actually way more um, favorable um, if, I remember, if I remember that rightly, I think Link says you only need two or three towns and you, you, may, you maybe only need to get to the mountain keep in one of them in order to actually unlock it. So it's fairly uh, easy to obtain. But you can get the defences in Meithelberg, in Goblin Town, in Framsburg, in Mount Gundabad and in Fennel. I'm sure Fennel gets it. Yes, it does. And so you can build it in one of those. So as you can see, you start with three of the regions that can already build it and then you can take Goblin Town and take Mount Gundabad to get the others. You can almost certainly also build it in Khazad-dum and if you can't I'll add that in because obviously it makes a lot of sense to build it in the actual regions that have the passes in them uh, but anyway so once you've built all of those and you've upgraded then that upgrades that unlocks the ability to upgrade and then you can build strongholds in castles and you can go all the way up to large city in your towns like everybody else um, so that is the way that that works. You also now follow a bit more of a similar pattern with the other nations in that your units are no longer really niche and um, powerful in the early game, but they used to drop off in the late game. That was very much the Wildman's kind of ploy, is that before the barracks event, you had a lot more units than everyone else, and you also had units that performed really well in certain roles, like Enidwyth had javelins, Anduin had ambush. 
Uh, that has kind of been done away with and you've just gone to a more conventional system whereby you you still have those little niche roles that like we've seen the woodman have all these um, hide anywhere units but generally speaking your units have all been buffed and you've been made more like a standard northman nation like dale angmar or rohan so there's less of that underdog story and just more of a unique way of playing as a certain nation now uh, a minor little thing for the Anduin as well, and something I've been banging on about for days on end, is that the Skin Changer Battalion now has a couple of officers in front of the General, so he shouldn't die so easily in battle, because there's two people standing in front of him, and they should hopefully give him some cover. Uh, a very minor, minor point. But that is the Anduin, so until we jump over and look at their units in the second half, there's little else to say there. But of course, if you have any questions, please do post them on this video, and I will monitor the comments more than I normally do for this video, and will answer those that crop up. But now we jump on over to Ennard Wyth. Welcome then to middle... oh I can't remember what Wyth means, but Ennard Wyth means middle something. I think it might mean middle... no I can't remember. Can't remember, sorry. <laughs> that was going to be such a good intro and it's turned into nothing. I just didn't want to say Ennard Wyth so quickly after saying it last time. Anyway, welcome to Ennard Wyth. <laughs> so Ennard Wyth's changes aren't all completely finished yet and we'll, you'll, that will become very apparent in, a, in almost straight away. But they have been overhauled as well to give them, again, progression, to give them much more of a focus on the fact that they are named the clans of Ennard Wyth. So we're trying to give them a more clan-like vibe. Uh, and generally we're just trying to make them more fun to play as. So the first thing about the revamp for Ennard Wyth, which is the point I mentioned about not being in the game yet, is that you, like Rune and like Harad, are going to start with a single region, Alkfud, the region of Lugyu. This will be the only place that you um, begin the game. And you need to essentially go around and claim the actual clan seats. But that's not to say that the clans are outright hostile to you, but many of them um, are many of them you will need to bring completely under your banner and that's the very basic concept so initially you only have access to tier one like militia tier units and they will come from various economic buildings they don't come from a barracks so Ennard White don't have an early game barracks now many of their buildings I don't think are actually set up yet so I can't show you much of that uh, but I'm more this is just talking through the concept really um, the all of their units are done and that's the main feature of, of Ennard White today but you, so you get a range of tier one units that come from various economic buildings and you'll get them obviously through Alkfood. You also get the clan that is within Alkfood, you get their units straight away obviously because you start with Alkfood. So the first point is let's go through the actual clans themselves. So the clan that lives within Lugyu or in the capital of Alkfood is the Mokhaini and they are going to be an axe based clan so their units are very axe focused, very aggressive. The next clan um, that is nearby uh, is from Herat, or Herat Shir is the region, and they are the Fowlan clan. And the Fowlan are, again, a relatively aggressive um, clan, uh, and they give um, sort of, they give more units that will hold the line. Next up in the north, in the region of Kyril and the town of Baradvin, are the... Um, Oh no, sorry, this one isn't a clan. This one isn't a clan. It's it's Vile. I wanted to make it a bit further out. So in Larfiren and the town of Vile um, come the Mordag, who are a fisherman clan, and they are the javelin heavy ones. So Enid White's javelin strength will remain, but you will need this region in order to really capitalize on the javelin units. Uh, next up to the south in Karas is the Kifai, and the Kifai are your primary ranged units, so they give you, generally speaking, your archers, but not uniquely. The, 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 I'm giving these, these clans one-line taglines, but that's very, very prescriptive. It isn't, in truth, actually that set in stone, and the lines between the clans are, are all very sort of blurred. Uh, Londangren or Angren Bay is the region. They don't give any units, they just give you your boats. So you need Londangren to to train your boats. And Ennard Wyth will still have their extra tier of boat, whereby they, they blur the line between the actual naval nations and everyone else. So you get that extra boat, but they, you need Londangren for it. Uh, from Londaire, the region is Maulfin, and the clan name is the Liadan, and they are very defensive. So Londaire will give you really defensive units, but it has a huge garrison. The general backstory being that the other clans are all sort of in service to Alkford already, 
and that they send their tier one units to fight for you under the current clan arrangement. But Londair do not. They stand independent. So they are sort of the rebel clan um, that you will need to go out and claim. Outside of that, then we move up to Argond, where we find the Filani, and the Filani are your primary cavalry-based clan. So they will give you most of your cavalry units, including your war wagons. So you'll want to go up there if you want to become a cavalry heavy nation. And lastly, away to the east in Erun Vaughan are the Dove Sheath, who are going to be the sort of quasi-druid um, clan. And they give you those more specialist units, like the chanting unit, but they also give you your best archer unit as well. Um, so that's a very... Th these two have been designed specifically to give you the best units of your nation, because they are, of course, the furthest away. So the recruitment on a basic concept is that I, everyone other than the Dove Sheath and Londaire gives you their tier 1 unit straight away. So you don't need their regions in order to train their militia units. However, all of the clan's tier 2 units, if indeed they have them, because the roster, we can't give every clan two units, so some of them only have one and it might be a tier 1 only or a tier 2 only. But in order to get their tier 2 units, the more mainstream units, the sort of post-barracks event units, if you will, you will need to capture the clan seats. Now, once you've captured the clan seat, those units then become available in a dedicated barracks building. So... In the first, all of your first tier units come from economic buildings and are all available straight away, regardless of to whether or not you've got the clan seat, except Londaire and Dol Vaughan. The tier two units and all of Londaire and Erun Vaughan's units require that you capture those regions. But once you've captured them, that unit is available everywhere, but you then get your barracks building. So Ennard White's barracks building is essentially a post barracks building only. It has no early tier units in it, which will... Um, mean that you obviously your units are coming from all over the place. So that's one of the primary changes to end wipe. That's the core feature of their gameplay. But then the third point on this is their progression system, and that involves uniting Ennard White into a modern nation. The the very, very, very basic backstory for it is that Ennard White realize that the world is currently fighting and teetering on the edge of absolute downfall with Sauron rising in power and then obviously nations rising to counter him and Ennard Wyth being allied to no one is very well aware that unless they can stand together bring their people together unite and rise up they will be washed away by whoever wins the coming climactic war so it's about forming Ennard Wyth into a nation and to do so they need to take a proper capital. So once you have claimed all the clan seats, you then also need to take Tharbad. Once you've taken Tharbad, it will be renamed to something far more Ennard Wyth-like, which means it will take some sort of Gaelic name that Lynx will think up in time. And you need to build a building in there, a sort of a monument to your new reign, a, a, a throne or a, a castle or just something along those kind of lines. You know, something to cement that that's your new capital. That's the seat of power of the newly born nation of Ennard Wyth. And once you do so, you are then unlock your tier three units. Um, and those are the ones that are actual elite. They will be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the nations around you. Obviously not the elves or the Dúnedain, you're still Ennard Wyth, but they are then on par with the late game units of Rohan, of Dale, of Dorwinian, Anduin, Agmar, those kind of things. So Ennard Wyth are no longer the underdog story who need to rely on javelins and sneaky skirmishes. They are now a far more mainline faction. More, they're more like the Northmen in the way that they play. Except in order to get those elites, you need to really unify. So whereas before, it's it's very similar to the original system, but where before unifying Ennard Wyth would unlock a single very elite unit, which you, was your best javelin unit, it now unlocks all of your elite units, but they are all better than they were before. In addition, Tharbad does give one sort of ceremonial warrior unit, which is your absolute best unit, and it comes from Tharbad only, and it doesn't have a name yet, um, oh, it will also come from Alk Food, sorry, because that was obviously your old capital. Um, but, and so you do get that one AOR very, very elite unit anyway. So that's the main change to Ennard Wyth. Now, for those of you who are particularly interested in the lore of each nation, um, Lord of Lynx has also added these seat buildings. Now, I'm sure the UI will probably change 
and also this one does need to actually move because the more dagger in this region not in this region but um these just give you a backstory because lord of links has written a backstory for each clan to really hammer home that aspect of the actual clans we've given them names we've given them backstories we've given them units warriors that correspond to their stories so there's just so much more attention has been given to anna Dwight, and particularly the fact that they are the clans so you'll note here you can see that certain units are um available and i'm i don't know if that is the final course i don't think it is i think that's a, a placeholder at the moment that the units are currently in these seats but there you see the axe units of um Alkford, which we're about to see in a moment now many of ended white's units have been given completely visual overhauls um, but some of them are re sort of worked and retooled units from the old roster but many of them are, are brand new so that's it. So that's the change to Ended Wife. Now, all of the units are pretty much in the game, but as you can see, some of the coding work, or a lot of the coding work, is still to be done. Um, and we're going to drop them down to a single region. The Mordag, who are currently in Baradvin, need to move over here to Vale. Um, or to Vai. I don't know if you'd pronounce the L, the double L, like in Spanish. Um, I doubt it. It's probably Vale. Anyway, um, there's some little changes to be made. But the roster is pretty much good to go. And that is what we are about to see next. But it's not just the Anduin and Enidwyth rosters I have to show you. There's also a couple of new battle maps that are going to be very, very um, useful and, and I'm very happy to have in the mod. And I'll show you those at the end after we've seen all the units. Um, and they are an excellent addition. So without any further ado then, let us jump in and look at um, Enidwyth, Dunland and Anduin. Because Dunland have also had their changes made um, to their units because Dunland are the one who are going to be least affected by the overhaul in truth. And whilst on the subject of Dunland, you do not need to claim Dunland to unite the clans. That is not a requirement anymore. So you just need your initial clan seats, so Karas, Londangren, Algford, Londair, Vile, Herat, Argond and Dol Vorn, which will almost certainly bring you to war with Dunland because of course they currently hold Vile. Uh, and they may well hold Tharbad by the time you need to attack it. But you don't need to defeat them and you don't need their regions. If you do claim their regions, you do now still get a couple of Dunlending units, but you only get them in the three Dunland regions. You no longer get half their roster anymore. That aspect has been cut. But you do get a couple of units in these three regions. So Dunland still plays a part in the Ened Wythe script. Um, and for Dunland, we haven't come onto them yet to discuss what will happen with Ened Wythe. Is only because Dunland only have had a few um, visual changes and a few new units added, whereas all the others, of course, have had massive overhauls. But we will see Dunland's units today, but we won't talk about Dunland on the campaign map today because that side isn't done. So, without any further ado, let's jump in and start with Enid Wise so we keep the continuity and look at their battle map models. Right, welcome then to Enidwyth's new visuals. Now, first caveat, not all of the UI down here is set up. This is particularly pertinent when we get over to the Enidwyth units in the tier 3. And also, the stats are still subject to a lot of adjustments. So today is purely looking at their visuals, really, and just seeing what type of units that they are. I've arranged them all in their clans down the centre, so you can see straight away that some clans do get tier 1 and tier 2, like the Moikani here, the Mordag, and the Fowlan. This clan over here, the Kifi, only have a tier 1 unit, and far over there, the Dove Sheath and Liadan only give tier 2 units, and those are the two that come from Londair and Dol Vaughan. Uh, and there's your Fowl and Cavalry down the middle. You'll still note, though, that Enidwyth are not a cavalry heavy nation at all, with only three actual cavalry units, and one of those, uh, one of those requiring that you capture Argond, and the other one requiring that you completely unite Enidwyth. So, not a cavalry heavy nation. You'll be fighting with Phylani herders for much of the campaign. You still do, however, have a very good javelin focus. Um, the Mordag skirmishers and Mordag fishermen both are javelin units, and Mordag is in Vile, so only a few regions away. Your clan bodyguard unit, the clan heralds is now their name, they are still javelin units, and I believe it is still planned... Um, oh, no, the Guardians of Ended Wife, who are going to become the totally elite AOR unit that comes from Tharbad only, um, they are going to be throwing axes instead of javelins, but there's still that throwing aspect. Javelins for Enidwyth are still very important and will still be better than everyone else's javelins, so that won't change. But let's just go straight through it then. So the first are the Mohaini, and you get the Tauta to start, who are just a berserker-style unit, as you can see, but with a little bit of armor, um, and that's your first 
um, aggressive unit that you'll get and then at the tier two once you've got built the barracks building so this unit actually comes in very quickly because remember the barracks buildings are no longer locked off by the barracks event and the actual um, limiting factor is have you captured the clan seat yet and of course you start with Alkford so the Mohaini are available to you straight away which means as soon as you build the barracks, you'll get the Ambakstoy. Now, we deliberated about whether or not we were going to use the names Tauta and Ambakstoy, but it did feel that it worked, and so in these two, they do have those names. Everyone else does have an English name. But the Ambakstoy, as you can see, are just axe and shield warriors, uh, but they're far more heavily armoured than they were before. Uh, and Ennard White does take on a bit more... They still have that very sort of barbarian feel, but now they feel like barbarians who have embraced armour rather than ones who shun it, although um, the Fowlum would like to have a word with me about that. Uh, but next up then, we come to the Mordag. Now, the Mordag, as I've already mentioned, are your early tier um, javelin units. So the fishermen standing here, they're hidden, sadly, but because they, they can hide anywhere. Uh, they are obviously good early tier javelins. Missile attack at the moment is at 7, but as I say, don't worry about the stats at the moment. But a very aggressive and good early javelin unit. And then once you've built the barracks and you've claimed Vile, you get the skirmishers, who are a, just a better version of the javelin unit before, of course. And then I think they have swords after that. Um, oh no, they're skilled against... Oh no, all javelins are skilled against mounts. No, I think they might have axes because they're effective against armour at the moment. Um, I don't know why I'm guessing because it is actually written over here on my left hand side. Oh, it just says javelins. Uh, so, <laughs> javelin units. Next up, we come along then to the um, sort of wild and aggressive units, the Fowlin. Now, the Fowlin come from Herat, which is the region between Dunland and Ennard Wythe, a place checkered by warfare between the clans and, of course, Dunland when they were forced out of Rohan, where they used to live. Uh, so, a place of constant war. And um, so, the Fowlin border guards, as you can see here, are a sneaky, ambushing spear and shield unit. Um, and they are favouring the shirtless look. Do note that even units that have been reused, like this unit of course used to be the Angren, not the Angren Raiders, but the one before that, Grey Flood Raiders, they've still had enhancements. So a lot of them have had their head, the models for their heads improved, and indeed this actual, whilst this unit looks remarkably similar to the Grey Flood, I think they actually do have a different body style. Um, as we'll see when we jump over then to the Fowlin Warriors. So Fowlin Warriors are again hide anywhere, so they're taking on that ambush look. Oh, in fact, these are the Grey Flood units from before. Uh, and they have a two-handed sword, so not effective against armour, but a good ambushing strike infantry unit. Um, giving the clans a little bit of ambush. In, in, in the general over, overhaul for Ennard Wythe and Anduin is to rather than force them to be good at a single thing, it just makes that single thing important to them, but um, widens out the rest of their ro roster so they don't have glaring weaknesses. They still have weaknesses, like Ennard Wythe has rubbish cavalry, Ennard Wythe doesn't really have a good holding the line unit. Um, I mean, the Lear then do fill that role, and we'll see them in a second. But um, two units out of your whole roster is not really enough, is it? Anyway, the key fight, which is the region of Karas, which is just to your south, they give you these huntsmen. So these are your earliest archers. Now remember, these all of the tier one units, this whole front line, are available straight away. You don't have to capture anywhere to get these. So you will always have an archer unit ready to go. You will note, though, that Enderwyth does have a fairly archer weakness with only three archers in the whole roster, and the other two do need regions to take. So you are dependent on your ambushing, your javelins, and um, you still do play with it. You need a little bit of skill to play with Ennard Wyth. You can't just form a line and throw the enemy at it. You need to um, work out which region you're going to take so that you can build your army accordingly. But anyway, that's the key fight. So those are your early tier archers, and again, a slight visual change from the previous units. Next up, we come to Fialani Herders, your first and most common cavalry unit. The Vailani are based in Argond across the river, but remember tier 1 comes all, you get tier 1 all the time. But the Vailani herders are a, again a javelin cav. They will probably have a spear when they finish with their javelin so that they can at least charge into the enemy because they will perform both of those roles. Your main early tier cavalry unit and also javelins because Enderwyth has excellent javelins. Once you've captured Argond, you then get the Failani War Wagons. Now the War Wagons of course are good um, if they're used rightly. They're chariots which means they're actually technically elephants with two people throwing javelins on the back of them. Um, they are useful but they're nowhere near as powerful as the Kandish and Runic chariots that both of those nations get. So do watch out for that. They're not going to turn the tide of battle. But they're a nice little unit um, and certainly worthwhile taking Argond to get them. So those are the units that come from... 
that give you an, a unit straight away, or the clans that give you a unit straight away. And then we come to the Liadan and the Dove Sheath. Now, both these are from Londair and Dolborn, respectively, and we'll start with the Liadan. The Liadan um, have two-fold features, really. Number one is they are a really defensive clan, and number two, they are heavily armoured. And we've taken that on the fact that they're based in Londair, which, of course, was for a very, very long time a Numenorean colony. Uh, until it was essentially abandoned by the Numenorians and then technically ruined in flood and abandoned by everyone. But in this alternate universe, um, the Liadan have taken up uh, taken up ownership of the root city and they've claimed all the stores of wealth and, and weapons and arms that were left behind. And that's why they are remarkably different from the rest of the roster. They stand out like a sore thumb, but in a good way, because they look absolutely fantastic. Uh, so the Leoden Spearmen and Leoden Billmen, but obviously both of those are just, the Beer Billmen are technically halberdiers, and they're of course Spearmen, so both very anti-cav, but also both very defensive. They won't get very many kills, although the Billmen might, because Billmen are armor-piercing as well. But the Spearmen certainly won't, but they will hold the line. They are Ennard White's most defensive units, and it is very, very worth your while trying to take Londair as soon as possible. And then we come over to the Dove Sheath. Now, the Dove Sheath do form that sort of very, those two very niche roles. The first are the Elders, who are your chanting unit. So they will primarily boost the morale of your forces. That's kind of their role. Um, but when they're not boosting the morale of your forces, they are two-handed spearmen. Note, they are not pikes. They are two-handed spears, which means they technically use the halberdier animation. So they're halberdiers that aren't effective against armor is, there, is basically what a two-handed spear is. Um, which means they're worse in many ways. But of course, there's only 47 of them because their primary function is to boost your morale and not to fight. But if they are called into a scrap, they are good and they will be viable. But more, obviously, all of these stats will be covered when version 5 releases and I do an Ennard Wythe overview. Um, at the moment, the stats are so subject to change, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to even click on the icons, to be honest, because it might get in your mind what their stats are. But those are unlikely to be the final. And then we have the Dove Sheath Foresters, very much like the Greenwood Foresters for Anduin. They are your Ranger unit. So they used to be called... Oh, I can't remember the name. They had a name from the Silmarillion, and I can't remember what it is. Ha ha Halith, Halith, Halith something, Halith Hunt. No, I can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway, they used to be called something else, but they've stayed in function essentially the same. They're just a really good archer unit for Ennard Wythe and very worthwhile taking um, Londair. But Londair, of course, is very far away, and so these units need to be rewarding, and they both are. Improving the morale of your lower tier units is invaluable, and having the rangers, who are your best archers, it depends on how you take your archers, really. We'll see the Ennard Wythe Marksman in a moment. But the Rangers will have the best actual ranged damage, whereas the Ennard Wythe Marksman will probably be an all-rounder. But anyway, that's the Londair, and those are the clans. Then we come on to your four elite units that are available once you've united as a new nation. Now, these have a completely new visual, although the last one, who currently are the Guardians of Enderwife, they haven't got their visual yet, so I can't actually show you them. But these three have, and their names are set as well. So it's Enderwife Marksman, Enderwife Guardsman, and Enderwife Cavalry. And they take the name Enderwife because this is when you've formed into a unified nation. And here they are. So looking far are far more heavily armoured and their stats will reflect that. I think the stats are sort of on their way, um, but they, they may be subject to a touch more improvement. You'll note the UI, of course, is not yet set up, um, but this is your elite unit. So you get one archer, you get one the guardsmen who are spear and shield and javelins again. Javelin's very much a core concept for Ennard Wythe. And then finally the Ennard Wythe Cavalry, elite cavalry units. So you get three fantastic late game units that will help you survive against the oncoming tide of likely either Gondor or Isengard, depending on who you decided to attack. Because I expect every Ennard Wythe player either defeats and removes Dunland or allies with them and removes them that way. Uh, and lastly then, so I won't talk about the Guardians because of course they're not set up, but lastly your Bodyguard, the Clan Heralds. So Clan Heralds are again Javelin units and once they finish with the Javelins they have two-handed swords. Um, and this is your Bodyguard unit. Now something I should note and point out that I didn't have room to actually include is that they have a visual upgrade that makes them look like your um, Uber Elite. So once these two units are actually set and ready, they will look similar when these ones are upgraded at a blacksmith. So your bodyguards do have that progression. You can upgrade them to make them join your late game roster. So you won't have these barbarian looking um, warriors fighting with your super late game units. 
Um, the late game unit, as we've already discussed, but we'll mention again, come from Tharbad and Alkfud, um, and they will be a very powerful um, axe-throwing unit that also then has a two-handed sword. But that might be changed because these two units are essentially identical. One is just smaller than the other one. Now, I know that that is the case for actually quite a lot of factions, but it might be worthwhile giving the bodyguard something else. I I I'd be leaning towards making the bodyguard an archer, actually, because you have so many units that throw a thing that having the bodyguard do it as well seems a, a touch overkill, but it's something we will discuss. So that is Ennard Wythe. Now let's jump over and have a look at Dunland's few visual changes. Welcome then to the changes for Dunland. Now the changes in Dunland are mostly minor cosmetic upgrades. There aren't very many new units, and most of it is just to give them a visual progression as they upgrade to be a proper nation, much like the other Wildmen changes. But there are a few new units, um, although no, actually, in truth, there is only one. The rest are all name changes. But this is the only real new unit. Now, as you can see, they don't have a name yet. Uh, but their function and their they are the unit that is rewarded to you for capturing and claiming Helm's Deep and um, Edoras. Um, they come in order to actually train them. You need to take Helm's Deep. You need to take Edoras. You need to build a special building in Edoras, and then they. I think they're going to come from that. As you can see, we haven't ironed it out yet. It may be that you need to defeat Rohan completely to train them, or it may just be you need Helm's Deep and Edoras. Uh, but in any event, they are going to be a very, very elite cavalry unit, essentially binding the two nations together. It's a, it's a combination of Rohan's cavalry skill and the Dunlending overlords they now serve. <laughs> um, and they're a, just a very late game elite cavalry unit for Dunland. But they do require that you will essentially defeat Rohan, if not actually fully defeat Rohan. Um, you can see at the moment, and I think that is how they're going to be, rather than taking that very lance-like hitting effect, they're going to be a very armor-piercing and aggressive axe-wielding cavalry, which seems a little... Um, Possibly unrealistic to wield such a ridiculous axe on a horse, but what the hey, it's nice to add variety. They also have the horn helmets, which used to be a feature of the Dunherd champions, and you'll see why that is no longer a feature in a second. Next up, there's been a visual change for a few units. The Dunish Hunters are one. Also, all of the previous, there were three units before that were called Clan something, so Clan Hunters, Clan Spearmen, and Clan Axemen. They've been renamed to Dunish Hunters, Dunish Spearmen, and Dunish Axemen, so as to not cross and tread on the toes of Ennard Wythe. They've got a bit of a visual upgrade, as you can see, taking on a sort of padded leather effect, and the Dunlending Horsemen have that same visual as well. But also, the Dunish Clansmen and Axemen both now also have that visual but they upgrade to it so they start with this sort of fur very wildman like barbarian visual and then when they upgraded a barracks they change to this more uniform leather protective form so that's a change to Dunland's very early tier units because these are your early tier units as are the huntmen as well but also, your late game units have had a bit of a visual change, and we, the, here we are with wolf pikes and wolf swords. Now, in the earlier tier, they have just this sort of chainmail, head to toe chainmail, and they upgrade to get um, whatever that is, someone in the comments will say. But um, they get a visual and an actual armor boost when they upgrade at a barracks. So they've got a nice upgrade chain throughout as well. You'll note they also then take on the elite helmet that we've seen on the to be done unit. Um, so visual links between all of your elites, which is very nice. Also, the Dunherd champions, as I've just mentioned, have been completely changed in how they look, and their helmet has been given over to the elites. So they now look almost identical to the Beast Slayers, who were renamed as Dunherd Slayers to give them unity, and that is very much the role they now perform. They're very um, mid-tier, strong javelin and then anti-armor units, and the Dunherd Slayers are strong archers. So your mid-tier is, the Dunherd units now form your mid-tier and they're both very, very strong units. But if you're really lamenting the loss of the two-handed sort of mace that they used to use, because you can see they now use two-handed axes, then lament no longer, for it has been given to the lower tier Dunlending Berserker instead. So Dunland's Berserker unit now stands out a bit from the pool of very early tier strike infantry who all seem to have two-handed axes they now have that bizarre mace that the dunherd champions used to use which i think is a very nice change and gives them their berserkers something that makes them stand out a bit also your bodyguard has been given a bit of a visual overhaul as well and there they stand so they're a bit more unique amongst your roster now so that they stand out a little bit better so those are the visual changes to dunland but of course as i say dunland's campaign side has not been done yet so i can't really talk about how this is 
all going to play out in the campaign because we haven't come to Dunland properly yet. But we knew that they only had very few um, unit changes, so Hummingbird has got on and done those already. And so next up, we will jump over and have a look at the Anduin, and then we will end on looking at the two new custom settlements. So the more that this video has gone on, the longer I've thought about it, I feel very confident, in fact, almost certain that I have shown you the Anduin roster. But then I thought to myself, it makes sense to show all three rosters in the same video, and so I'm going to plow ahead anyway. But I'm almost confident, I'm almost confident, I'm almost certain we've seen these before. But in any event, this is the Anduin roster. So the three units that are available to you, no matter what decision you make, are the Veilsmen, who are early tier spear and shield units very average stats but not terrible but um, lower than you would really want uh, but of course they're still infinitely better than orcs um, which is one of your primary enemies in the early tier so it's early tier spearmen you've got the store sheriffs who of course need no introduction because despite their meager looking stats they are actually the heroes of the anduin campaign and when used well are quite possibly one of the best units in the game in terms of cost effectiveness i don't think there is a better unit than store sheriffs they are absolute monsters and it's because of their armor piercing stones they have 50 of them and if you can let them fire all 50 they will shred anyone they bring sauron on they'll bloody well take him down so an absolutely insane unit that is <laughs> very useful if you can use them well but they only come from um the gladden fields region so they only come from one region phenom uh, so you've got to watch out for that. But they're at monsters. Don't let anybody hit them in melee because they just die like butter. But they will <laughs> throw their stones till the cows come home. And they will hit those cows square between the eyes and knock them down time and time again. They also get Veil Archers. Now this is where the Anduin does shine a bit and steps on Dale's toes, I suppose, in that they get very good archers throughout their whole roster, actually. Um, and Veil Archers are no exception. So even your Militia Archers, very, very dependable. Also, I should we should start up here as well. Um, the, other, the only other two units that are available for you, no matter which barracks you build, are your bodyguard, the skin changers. They're over here. Um, of course, the skin changers need, again, no introduction. They're monsters of units. Not very good at holding the line because there's only 30 of them, but they are so aggressive. And um, with their um, two hit points, 17 defense, and 24 armor-piercing melee attack, they can kill basically anything. But there are only 30 of them, so they do die if used poorly, which is something I am absolutely wonderfully adept at using them poorly. I get them killed all the time, but if you do know how to use them, they are one of the best bodyguards in the game. And I will get round to ranking bodyguards, and they will be featuring high, I can assure you. The other unit you get everywhere are the elves, Sylvan March Wardens. So they come from Dol Guldur only, and they just have elven archer stats, as you'd expect. They're, they're a fantastic unit. If you can take Dol Guldur and get these, they will help you no end. A dream of a unit, to be honest. Uh, and they also look really nice as well. I really like their visual design. <laughs> right, so then we come to the choice you have to make in every settlement. Do you want Bjornings? Do you want Woodman? Or do you want Aetheod? As you can see quite clearly on the unit map, there is a clear distinction. Range, cavalry, infantry. That's very, the, in one word, that would be each nation or each alignment. So the Bjornings in the first tier give you Axemen and Spearmen. Uh, the Spearmen are good, defend, dependable Spearmen, almost twice as good as your Veilsmen, so a huge boost. And the Axemen are fantastic early tier strike axe. Uh, very, very aggressive. Armor piercing, frighten enemies as well, which is always useful. Attack of seven and charge of six. So good early tier, aggressive and defensive unit. In the second tier, they get upgrades to both of those in the form of the Bjorning shield bearers, who have this really cool, awesome, very Celtic looking shield, I think. Celtic or Germanic, uh, feel free to correct me. Uh, so a very, very dependable unit. And again, they just have much better stats than the spearmen before them. But remember that spearmen don't kill really anything. They're terrible at killing, but they can hold a line really well. And by that, I mean they just survive for ages. So if you can bring something in to attack the back while the spears are holding, they will hold. And of course, against cavalry, then they really will start killing things. They don't kill infantry, but they kill cavalry like the best of them. And the upgrade to the Bjorning Axemen are the Bear Warriors, who are also one of your best infantry units. They are monster strike infantry, and they also look fantastic. They have such a clean and polished look. And I'm really pleased at the way that Hummingbird was able to salvage and keep the winged helmet, because I think on the Karok Guard, it, it, they looked a bit subpar, but these look fantastic. I think they're a really good looking unit. I like the fact they've all got a little rune um, etched on their arms as well. But anyway, Bear Warriors, attack of 11, charge of 8, defense of 21. They inspire your forces, effective against armor. They um, make up for the worst stats than the skin changes by having 120 people. So they are a fantastic unit. And in many ways, arguably better than skin changes because there's just so many more of them. 
Lastly, though, you're also supported by the Bjorning Defenders, who is a unit that used to belong to Enid Wythe, as I'm sure many of you will look at that and think, hey, that looks like the Moot Guardians. Well, you would be right, because it was. But they now have a shield that has the bear paw on it. Uh, Bjorning Defenders are the only one that bucks the sort of trend of the Bjorning tier by being a bit of both. They, were, they can hold the line relatively well, but they will also happily flank the enemy and actually get some kills with their axes. Because, of course, axes and swords are better at killing infantry than spears are because of a hidden um, feature in the game that it doesn't tell you, and that is that spears actually suffer when attacking infantry. They do less damage than the uh, card would, would have you believe. But then we come on to the Woodmen. So the first tier for the Woodmen are the Woodmen Warriors and the Woodmen Hunters. These very Kievan Rus looking fellows um, are fantastic archers and I can attest to that. They are monsters in the early game. Remember you can get this unit straight away. You only need to build the Woodmen Barracks um, in one region and you already get a pre-built Woodmen Barracks in Leotholt I believe, the town that's actually in Mirkwood. So you can get these straight away. Um, they are really, really, really good. And we'll get so many more kills than the Vale Archers do. They're a fantastic archer, very worthwhile getting. The Woodman Warriors are the other one, and they are Ambush Champions. Now, these ones aren't hiding, because they are my general, and generals can't hide, but um, they can hide anywhere normally. Um, and they that's really their main focus. They're a bit subpar, really. They're attack 6, defense 9. I mean, the Veilsmen have 6 defense, only 3 behind. But they have, obviously, a 3 times better attack. Far more aggressive than your militia. They will actually get kills. And if you can ambush the enemy with them, then you'll get a lot of kills. And then again, we have the similar feature. So we upgrade directly. So at tier 2, we've got the Woodman Wardens, who are an upgraded version of the Warriors. They can still hide anywhere, but now they also throw Javelins. When they finish with their Javelins, they're just a better version of the war of the Warriors before them. So better armor, better attack. Um, they're just better. You always want this unit instead of that unit if you can train it. And also there's an Archer upgrade as well into the Woodman Trackers. So the Woodman Trackers are your late game mainline Archer. And I say that because they are um, uh, them and the Greenwood Foresters, of course, both perform very similar roles, uh, but the Greenwood Foresters cost a little bit more. And what you get for that is arguably not really worth it for an archer. Uh, the Woodman Trackers, of course, have a six missile, as do the Greenwood Foresters, but the Greenwood Foresters have better melee charge and total defense. So um, they are the Greenwood Foresters is a better all rounder. But for the extra 100 coins, it's up to you to decide whether it's worth it or not. Um, the Woodman Trackers will perform the Archer role fantastically. Although do note that the Foresters actually have worse armour than the Trackers, so they don't like being shot at as much as the Trackers do, but they do have um, a shield, whereas the um, Trackers don't. Also, the Foresters have a 7 charge, whereas the Trackers have a 3 charge. So it's very much that the Foresters are an all-round infantry and archer unit and so you're paying for a hybrid unit not a dedicated archer whereas the trackers are a dedicated archer um, and will perform that role it may be that their stats could do with being a touch dif uh, differentiated a bit better and that may be the case by the time version 5 releases but we shall see and lastly, the Aethaeod, they give you your cavalry. So as discussed, you get the horsemen at the start. They're a Jav Cav and then a good Charge Cav after that as well. Um, the Aethaeod, of course, are the precursors to Rohan. And we've written it such that they still retain some of that excellence in cavalry command. So they are a really good cavalry unit, is the short way of saying what I just said. Then you get three units in the later tier, in the second tier of the barracks. The Aethaeod Archers, who you will get used to using because Gleowine has them as his bodyguard. They're just really good Archer Cav. Um, cav archers, sorry. Of course, they're nowhere near as good as Canned or Rohan's cav archers, but they are still, they're, they're the third best, if you will. You'd still want them if you can't get Rohan's or Canned, which you can't because you're playing in the Anduin. And then you get a dedicated charging cavalry, the Aethaird cavalry, and they perform that role fantastically with a charge bonus of 11, a defense of 17, and an attack of 7. So, a really, really good, hard hitting cavalry unit. That's the one you want to be charging into things. They're the one that's going to get the kills on the charge. And then the Frams. Guard, as again already discussed, whilst being very elite and heavily armoured, 21 total defence and an 11 and attack, their charge bonus is a bit lower and they are actually designed as an anti-cavalry cavalry unit. So they are going to be out there killing um, the elite cavalry of Dol Guldur, or they're about the only cavalry unit you'd actually come up against really, aren't they? Or unless you want to turn on your um, <laughs> your child nation of Rohan, then the Frams Guard will come into their own as you gut Rohan's roster. Um, by fighting against them. 
So those are the changes to the Anduin roster, which as I'm, so I'm sure we've seen, but they're all now together. And then we will end the video on the two new custom settlements. And I'll let you have a guess with the first one at what you think it might be when it pops up on the screen. Welcome then to the first of the two new battle maps. Now, first point is that they are both remarkably similar. So you would be forgiven in um, thinking that they might be the same because they use the same basis. But this is the first one. I've given you the map and I've given you this slow crawl across the screen and place your bets. Please post your comments as to what you think this is and then update them when I say what it is and tell me if you were right. Now, obviously, by the time we get out here, you should now be starting to get it in droves because as we crest this final hill and enter the port district, it becomes incredibly obvious as to who this is. Is. This is, of course, the ancient Numenorean port city of Umbar. It now has its own unique settlement, and it is entirely thanks to the DCI Last Alliance team that this settlement exists. This is their creation that they very kindly allowed us to use in Divide and Conquer. I heavily recommend checking out DCI Last Alliance if you are interested in the Second Age, or you just want to play Third Age, but in a sort of a different time period with different nations. The boats, of course, are taken from Battle for Middle Earth, and they 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 um, blend into the, the Total War setting really easily, or into the Med Two engine, sorry, really easily. But it's a really fantastic city. I mean, at its core, of course, it is just a large Gondorian city. There's nothing special about the actual city itself. All of the uniqueness comes from its port district. Now you can attack up this way, you can attack the gate over here, but you wouldn't really ever need to. So this is all really just visual fluff to be honest, but what fluff it is. It looks fan bloody tastic. So this is Umbar in the game. Pictures just do not do it justice. It looks amazing. I really love this dry dock area. I think it's fantastic. And all the ships being built and all the ships heading out, it just it's a dream. It's such a good battle map. I really, really like it. This custom port area as well, I think, is really well done. But in an attempt to make sure that the AI doesn't break, that is why the port does not blend with the city. Because were the port to blend in with the city, there'd be real AI issues with how they actually um, tackle the battle map. So uh, quite understandably, they've taken a core battle map that they know works and then added some visual enhancements. Sim like this building here, for example, that obviously has been placed there on purpose as a unique central feature of the city, as have all the spires that you can see dotted around the sides. So that is the city of Umbar. But there is another one. And as I've already said, it's based off of this same model. But RK has then sprung his magic upon it to make it look different and we will jump over and see what that one is now just look at it it is absolutely fantastic i'm fanboying before i've even got to the walls i can see the tower already i'm i'm just uh, this is amazing this is so much more than i was expecting i didn't realize how much rk had actually changed this is insanely good this is Obviously, the best city on the face of Arda, with the castle high in the background. You can already see because I'm panning over accidentally. Look at these amazing buildings featured in the blue tiles of the great castle on the hill in the promontory. And of course, standing proud on the hill off to the side of the castle, even as its own little bridge, that's a dream, is the Tirith Ayar. Because this, of course, is the great famed Gondorian port city of Dol Amroth. And once again, a very, very same basis. Now, first of all, we must put out our thanks again to DCI Last Alliance because this battle map is a version of their version of Umbar, obviously. So we've taken Umbar, or RK has done all of this. This is all RK. He's taken Umbar, he's kept the port, changed it to be Gondorian, so gutted all of the references to Umbar, and then put in a castle instead of a town because, of course, Dol Amroth is famously a castle and not a city. Then he's added in a few more unique buildings so that it takes on a bit more of a... It then feels far more unique. It doesn't just feel like a standard Gondorian castle. It feels like a, a, a real important place. Some of these spires are new as well. The dome in the far side there. The Tirith IR is just... I absolutely love that. That, of course, is the Elite Dwarfs campaign strategy model of the towers in the Emun Baraid, the Tower Hills. So that is one of the Elostirian towers on the battle, on the campaign map, and its model has been transposed into the battle map by RK and then given the Gondorian blue tiling. I'm annoyed I can't get high enough to look at it because the castle isn't shaking me up high enough. 
there you go. And then it's been given the blue tiling so that it stands out. The Tirith IR, of course, was famously built by elves back when Dol Amroth was not even called Dol Amroth and was used as a staging ground and a, a sister city, if you will, of Atheland, where the elves used it to head off into the west. Um, but this is such a fantastic battle map. This is such a dream to defend as well. This is everything you would want. Now all those times that Umbar might accidentally attack your castle, which they won't actually because Umbar no longer has its Corsair script. But So Dol Amroth is likely to actually never be attacked. But if it ever is, it now has this fantastic cast custom battle map. And this is brilliant. When the enemy makes it through the gate, they've then got to either go right or they go left, and they've got to get then through up and through the second gate, which many of you will be familiar with this layout. This It is based on a standard late game stronghold from the base game. It's just been gondorian Gondorianified. So you've got these walls to shoot on the enemy once they've broken through the main gate. Then you've got they've got to slog their way through here. Then they've got to get through this secondary, which doesn't have a gate, but at least is another checkpoint. And then there's the square at the back. So the castle doesn't actually really do out. It is just there as a visual, as is the Tirith IR. But it's just so fantastic. I didn't expect to love it as much as I do now that I'm here. Um, I think it's fantastic. And the port area, of course, is wonderful as well. Now, of course, if we are to, um, I think well, something we will now definitely need to do is change where the port is on the campaign strategy map because the first thing that's going through my mind is that the port on the battle map is on the southern side of the promontory and on the campaign map it's on the northern side. So I think we might need to change that round so that there's a little bit of uniformity. Not that anyone really is bothered or even probably noticed, but uh, it was one of the first things that I did because I'm inherently negative. <laughs> no, actually, I think I'm rather positive, but um, it just stuck in my mind. I don't really know why. But this is a fantastic battle map, and that, with what a wonderful ending, as the sun sets high behind it. Oh, that's almost screenshot worthy. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. There we go. It's gone. Look at that. That is fantastic. I am going to take a screenshot of that. There it goes. <laughs> what a dream of a settlement. But there we are. That is the end of Developer Diary 33. Apologies if there's been a little bit of rambling. Try and do something else while you're watching the video. Don't just watch it straight out because I'm sure it will dull you till the uh, end of time. But there we are. The next Developer Diary will likely tell you all about Moria because I'm sure they will then be next on our list once Enidwyth, Dunland and Anduin are all set in stone. There are little bits of bobs to do for all of them still, but Lord of the Links is ploughing away, um, as is Hummingbird, and we everything's coming together quite nicely. Um, RK, of course, is back after a brief stint, and the Elite Dwarf is also back after well-earned breaks on both of their parts. Um, um, I don't hold it against them at all. Take as long as you ever need. Dak obviously never has a timeline, um, and the next version will release when it is ready. Which, of course, I can give you a date, actually, if you're all ready. Get a pen and paper out, because for the first time in Dak's history, we're going to tell you when the next version will release, and it is going to release on... 7. Farewell.